Our next presenter is an associate professor in civil engineering in the Faculty of Engineering and a principal of uh, Montfort and Associates, a consulting company that specializes in road safety and trucking operations. Given that Dr. Janet Montfort is an expert in transportation engineering and technology, it seems fitting that she is always on the go. <laughs> she is the current vice president of the Canadian Institute of Transportation Engineers, chair of the United States Transportation Research Board's Motor Vehicle Size and Weight Committee, and counselor of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of the province of Manitoba, one of our sponsors for the event today. Forgive all the transport related puns, but uh, Dr. Montfour also has a drive. She was the recipient of 2004 Engineers Canada Young Engineer Achievement Award, one given only to a group of 160,000 engineers. So it is a very, very prestigious award and we are honored to have Dr. Montfour in our group. And also, to top it off, she was the nominee for Canada's top 40 under 40 for 2010. When it comes to transportation technology, she is the best person to bring us, bring us all up to speed. Welcome, Dr. Montfort. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. J.S. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, before I start, yes. Can I keep going? Okay, so before I start, I just have to say, I don't have any chocolates, okay? <laughs> I didn't bring my kitchen equipment. <laughs> and this is gonna be an impossible act to follow, okay? So you're gonna have to bear with me, okay? Because it's not my fault to have been scheduled at this time. <laughs> So anyway, so like uh, Dr. Jaya said, um, I am an associate professor in civil engineering and um, I, I love my job. I love what I do. I uh, decided to become a civil engineer when I was very young. I was actually in uh, junior high when I thought, uh, you know, I should become a civil engineer. But I didn't know I wanted to become a professor at that point. And uh, things just worked out the way they did and uh, here I am today, okay? Um, my area of research is uh, in uh, involving um, pedestrian issues, so I deal a, lo uh, a lot with people, and I also deal with moving uh, freight, so truck transportation. And the idea is to use technology as much as possible to make our jobs easier, okay? So today, I want to talk to you about um, these four issues. So I wanna tell you a little bit about transportation engineering because sometimes we don't quite understand what transportation engineering is. And uh, just yesterday I was at a, at a conference uh, downtown and it's going on today and it was uh, on yesterday. And, uh, and sometimes people get a little bit confused as to what a transportation engineer does. People know about um, transportation, uh, the movement of uh, goods, movement of people, but we not always associate that with a transportation engineer, okay? So I'll tell you about transportation engineering. I'll tell you about uh, the last 100 years in technology. Not that I'm that old, okay, but I've read about it. And uh, <laughs> tell you about intelligent transportation systems and then what's gonna happen in the next 25 years. So, um, so let's uh, start by talking about transportation engineering. And this would be a point where if I had brought chocolates, I would have said, first chocolate is gonna be given away right now. But instead, you know, actually, when I saw you with your chocolates, I thought, oh my God, I gotta go get something to give away. <laughs> so I thought, oh, look at you, you have some other stuff left. <laughs> oh, is that for me? <laughs> so instead I have this little uh, traffic signal stickers, which are really good too, okay? <laughs> so, I wanna know, what can you tell me transportation engineering is? If I asked you, what is transportation engineering? What do we do as transportation engineers? What would you say we do? And I can't throw it at you, so I'm gonna have to walk up. Go ahead. Okay, make things move fast and safely. It's close, so you get it, okay? 
Okay, anything else? What do transportation engineers do? Yes. Efficiency. Efficiency, absolutely. So we move things fast, efficiently, safely. Okay, so there's a lot of things that come with transportation engineering. And really, what we do is, we do all those things, but we try to apply technology and scientific principles. So, um, and, and what we do is we try to plan things, we design things, operate and manage facilities to move people and goods, because we're always in the, in the, in the business of people and goods, not only people. Um, and actually, I say to my students, we're in the business of moving people and goods, not cars and trucks. Okay, those are two very different concepts. So, um, safely, fast, comfortably, economically, and environmentally friendly. So, to give you an example of what uh, we would do as transportation engineers, um, I wanted to uh, show you, um, talk a little bit about the interstate highway system. So, how many people have driven on the interstate highway system? Okay, uh, good. So, the interstate highway system is one of those phenomenal projects. It has been uh, designated as uh, the greatest public works project ever undertaken in the history of humankind. Okay? Now, just a few tidbits about the interstate highway system. How long do you think it is? If you were to measure the center line of the entire interstate highway system, how long would you think uh, the system would be? And you know what? You get a traffic signal for, for that. <laughs> if you get it right. So how long do you think it will be? Oh, give me a number. I don't know if it comes with <laughs> Just give me a number, a million meters, a mi give me in kilometers. <coughs> do you think it's, okay, do you think it's more, it's longer or shorter than 50,000 kilometers? More. Longer? 100,000 kilometers? More. Longer. Okay, so who says, who says it's longer than 100,000 kilometers? Okay, who says it's shorter than 100,000 kilometers? Let's see, shorter than 100,000 kilometers. Okay, so you're the only ones that can keep guessing, okay? Everybody else can't. So, <laughs> so do you think it is shorter than 75,000 kilometers or longer? I'm narrowing it down now, so you're free to jump in whenever you'd like. Okay, like how, how long do you think it would be? 60, you know what, you're close enough, so you get the traffic signal. <laughs> <laughs> so the interstate highway system is uh, about 72,000 kilometers in length. So if you think about it, um, when you look at how wide Canada is, we're looking at about um, eight times across the country, okay? Now, what about the numbering system? Does anybody know anything about the numbering system? How do you know if a highway, if an interstate goes north and south or east and west, looking at the number? Zero. So, so even numbers go across and odd numbers go up and down? That's right. So even numbers go across and odd numbers go up and down, right? What about around the, the cities, uh, the, uh, the, the equivalent to a perimeter highway? How, how do you tell if it's actually a loop around a city? It's got three numbers, right? So it's got one number and then the other two numbers are basically the, uh, the interstate number. So, so that's how you tell. And the further out you are from the center of the city, the, the larger the first number is. So if it's, a, say, Interstate 94, if you're uh, on Interstate 494, you're closer than if you were on 694. You're closer to the downtown of the, of the, of the area. Okay. The interstate system was built from 1956 to 1993. So that took a few years to build, okay? And one key thing about the interstate highway system is that it was actually built for defense purposes. Okay, it was not something that was built for, uh, to necessarily to move people and goods. It was built because we needed to protect uh, the people in the U.S. in case of war. So we needed to have a good system to move tanks and to move the army from one place to the other. That's how it was sold. Now, why am I telling you about the interstate highway system? Well, because it's a phenomenal project, I think. But also because 
This is a place where you can see full involvement of transportation engineers. It's a massive transportation engineering uh, pro uh, project. And so we started the planning process. And when we say that uh, we, uh, we do uh, planning, what we're looking at, planning would involve things such as, do I build right across the city, the mid uh, uh, downtown? Do I go around downtown? And the interstate highway system, the construction and the design, the planning of the interstate highway system created a lot of challenges for engineers. Because at the time when we started designing it, when we started thinking about it, uh, there were a lot of, we didn't understand a lot of things. So sometimes it was easier to just cut across a neighborhood. And sometimes, you know, like the, the, the parents would live on the, would end up on this side of the, of the road and then the, the grandchildren on the other side and the interstate highway system running right across. And it kind of divided communities, okay? So, so that's basically planning. And sometimes maybe we didn't do a good job. But we have learned a lot over the years. And now hopefully we do a better job. But engineers were involved in the planning of the system. Then we were also involved in the design of the system. And so, so we come up with all kinds of interesting, fascinating designs. So um, it can be very complex, it can be very simple. But the key issue is that we need to recognize when we are designing a system that it is built for users, okay? So it doesn't matter how exciting or how boring it is. You have to be able to accommodate the users in a safe and efficient manner. And that's a key issue. So when you're designing a road, we have seen a lot of technologies that have changed over the years that accommodate people in different ways. So for example, in the 1960s, when we were designing the interstate highway system and starting to build it actually, um, we started noticing a lot of collisions and a lot of people leaving the road and a lot of things that were not exactly the way we had planned it, okay? And because we were, we, transportation is one of those fields, I think, where we take, we accept death, and we should not. So if you, for example, if you build a house, would you expect it to fail, collapse on your head? No, right? If you built a, a dam, would you expect it to collapse and then flood everything? No, right? If there's a highway built, would you expect people to die there as a result of collision? No. So why do we kill so many people every year in collisions? And it's okay, I mean, you, I bet you read the paper every day, it's like, track accident on highway one, and you just flip the page. Why don't you say, oh my God, look at that track accident. I'm just gonna fold my whatever, MLA or whoever, okay? <laughs> so anyway, so we started noticing that things were happening. So, that's, so technology started appearing in terms of how do we prevent these collisions from happening? So we started building guardrails. Uh, we started, uh, instead of having fixed poles, we started testing new technologies that if a car were to hit the pole, it would just break away at the base and it would not injure or it would minimize the injury uh, to the occupants of the vehicle. Uh, we started building different types of, uh, of systems, different types of roads, maybe flatter slopes, uh, so that when people, when vehicles were to leave the road, they could actually recover. So those were things that we incorporated into the designs with time. And then of course, the operation of the system. That is one of the most exciting things, I think, because this is where we use a lot of technology. And I want to show you um, how we operate a lot of the interstate highway system. And actually, this is also something that uh, is done in, 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 in Canada. There's a lot of places where we use uh, advanced traveler information systems to operate uh, the system. When you drive on the interstate, have you noticed that there is all these variable message signs where you can actually say, it, where it says, well, accident two miles ahead, or, uh, uh, or it will tell you um, uh, congestion over the next five kilometers, or it will take you 10 minutes to get to that particular exit. Have you seen those? Have you ever wondered um, what's behind that, how that works? Now I'm going live into, this is the Department of Transportation in Texas, and this is one of the, uh, the websites that they have. It's called the Trans Guide. Uh, in, for San Antonio. And so what this gives you is it gives you live information about the uh, traffic conditions. And this is how we manage, we operate the roads in many places. So the map tells you right away that uh, the congestion is low along these segments. 
uh, it, info, it gives you information about incidents, um, and it gives you, say, information about um, the location, in, the details about the incidents, the, the details about everything that's going on so that you can make more informed decisions. And this is all live. So does anybody know how that works? What all goes into that? So I'll give you one hint. There's video cameras, right? And, and the network is filled with video cameras depending on where, um, on what areas you want to, uh, to concentrate in. So say for example, uh, we may have like this whole highway, highway, uh, um, say this is highway 90, highway 10 actually, it's all loaded with video cameras. So you can actually click on each of those cameras and you can see how traffic is moving. So this is all live, right? So we have a combination of sensors in the road embedded in the pavement and the sensors can actually look at the speeds of vehicles. Uh, they, can, they can classify vehicles. They can see how fast vehicles are going. Um, we have uh, video cameras that monitor also the uh, congestion points. Um, we, have, uh, we have full sets of wiring in the pavement. And so that can trans uh, transmit the information to a central management system and they can make better decisions. And then they type in messages like congestion 10 miles ahead or uh, speed so much two miles ahead, or accident at so-and-so location, and then the information is sent to uh, emergency services so they can go and pick up a vehicle that may have been involved in a collision. So this is one way in which transportation engineers manage the system, okay? Now, that, but that's actually just a little bit of a, an introduction as to what transportation engineering is and what we do as transportation engineers and how we use some of the technologies to, uh, to do that. But let, let's talk about the last 100 years, because there's been a lot of stuff that's happened in the last 100 years, okay? And if I had to, if I asked you, what do you think is the most important technological development that has happened in the last 100 years? What would you say it is? And, and let's think about transportation, okay? So what is the most important, if you had to put your money on the most important technological development that has happened in the last 100 years, what would you say? Traffic what? Traffic lights. traffic lights, that's good, that's good. Okay, uh, you, know, you get the traffic signal. <laughs> that's a good one, what else? Electricity. Like the sensors? Yeah, like right in, okay, uh, v okay, that's a good one too. Uh, signals on vehicles, okay, Wh what else? Yes? Studying flow patterns of traffic. Studying flow patterns of traffic, that's important, that's important. See, the thing is, I don't know the answer to that one, so I'm, I'm just listening to what you have to say. <laughs> because there's been so many technologies that have taken place. If I had to put my money on something, I would say, I would say maybe global positioning systems, okay? Maybe because global positioning systems have helped us incredibly to locate the position of a vehicle, to communicate with other vehicles, to do a lot of things, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the thing is that technology doesn't just evolve, and transportation has not just evolved because of evolving, okay? It has, it has evolved because we live in a world of change. Our world is changing. And uh, there's changes in demand. So for example, at the beginning of the century, we needed transportation for, for certain specific reasons. Now we need it for maybe other things. So people's needs change with time. So as you get older, your needs change. As one generation uh, moves into other generations, the, the demands change, so the needs change. Um, there's also changes in people's values. And if you think now, we're very much into sustainable transportation, right? Everything has to be green, everything has to be fuel efficient, we have to reduce greenhouse gases. But then you think back to the 1960s, and what was, what was the hottest thing in the 1960s? I don't know either because I wasn't born in the 1960s, but I've read about it. <laughs> I have been told about it. In the 1960s, it was the automobile. We wanted to get places fast. We wa it was cool to have a car. Everybody wanted to have a car, right? So cars were very important. The construction of the interstate highway system was taking place right then. It was all, it was all full of, uh, of um, the requirement to have good mobility. And the, the way in which they would see mobility was through the use of cars. But that changed with time. 
before that, we had a different uh, type of uh, value. Maybe we place more value in walking. Okay, so we have changed over time. And because of that, things, the transportation system has had to change and accommodate to that. There's been changes in how we operate our system. Well, and sometimes we have, uh, uh, we have uh, just uh, free highways. Now we're more into uh, charging for the use of uh, highways, uh, introducing tollways. Uh, which, by the way, can somebody tell me why is it that um, we, uh, we can drive on a parkway, park on a driveway, and pay a toll on a freeway? <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, and changes in technology have not happened just for the sake of it. Technology responds to all these other changes. So let's look at a couple of technologies that we have seen evolve over the last hundred years. Let's look at the automobile first. I think that was an interesting technology, right? Um, so we started with the steam engine in the, in the 1770s. And uh, if you think about the steam engine, that was a very unique thing because it was like, whoa, look at this new thing. I can get my car, like a car, and I can get this thing, wagon, or whatever. It was a three-wheel. The first invention was really a three-wheel box that could move something at a whooping speed of two and a half miles per hour. Okay? And it had to stop every 10 or 15 minutes to regenerate steam. So, so we've come a long way from that. Then we went into the electric vehicles uh, in about the mid-1830s or so. And electric vehicles were basically using batteries, and it was the same thing. You know, we couldn't go so fast, um, and we had to recharge the battery all the time, right? So, so after that, we had a very uh, interesting breakthrough, and that was the introduction of the internal combustion engine. And with the introduction of this, it revolutionized the way in which we actually um, designed and uh, implemented, introduced more automobiles. And when you put that internal combustion engine together with the assembly line concept developed by Henry Ford, the whole vehicle industry took off. And so with time, you see how the technology has evolved to now hybrid engines, okay? Now hybrid engines are, um, um, they are basically uh, the type of engine that uses a combination of two different technologies, right? So electric and, ga uh, and uh, gasoline. And so what they're doing now is they are implementing more and more hybrid engines in, um, in no normal passenger vehicles, but also, at the conference that I was at yesterday, there's a lot of movement to implementing hybrid engines in the trucking industry. So that will create a huge uh, um, uh, improvement in terms of productivity for these vehicles. And what's coming down the, the pipe is fuel vapor engines, okay? And this is a really interesting concept because the way the internal combustion engine works is it combines, um, it combines uh, por portions of air with, uh, with gas but the fuel vapor, the proportions, the proportion of air is larger, much larger than the proportion of air that the internal combustion engine would use. So you would end up saving a lot of money and a lot of energy in terms of uh, moving the same type of vehicle. So this is a very new technology. It's not fully out, but it's something that uh, will be coming down the pipe. The other technology that has evolved and actually going back to your, uh, to your answer is traffic signals. Traffic signals is, uh, you know, you think back to 1968 in London. First traffic signal was a gas light. And so it's a, it's a little sad when you think about it because it's like, okay, um, I have a little thing, a little, you know, pole, and uh, if I need you to stop, then the arms go out. And then at night, they, they would go out and uh, put a little light, a red light, and the, a little candle with a red light in it, and so you would be able to see that there was a signal. But that, that was it, okay? Um, then the uh, concept evolved, and we started, we thought, okay, wait a second. For, in order for vehicles or for drivers to obey these signals, we need to have somebody, like a police officer there. So we, can, uh, we started building these traffic towers, and Detroit was really the first uh, place where all this took, uh, where, all, where all this happened. So they would have a police officer here in the middle of the road, and, they, and he or she, I guess most likely a he at that time, would direct traffic in different directions. Then we moved on to the very first three-colored four-way signal 
1920, also in Detroit. And this is when we started really seeing a, a larger evo um, evolution in terms of the uh, signals. Then we got into the more technologically advanced signals, where we used to actuate the signal with a horn, okay? And following that same line of thinking, we got into what we have now. And now we have a phenomenal system where we put sensors in the pavement, and when vehicles come up to the intersection, this, the controller knows that there is a car there and that it has to change the light to green. When you're driving, have you noticed that on the road, there's this little uh, diamond cuts, like right at the end of the road, like right at the, uh, close to the stop line? Yes? Okay, so those are the sensors. So if you, sto if you stop short of the sensor, then it's not, the, the signal is not gonna detect you. So when you get on the sensor, there is a, there is a, a field that uh, the vehicle, the chunk of metal cuts, and so it sends a, sig a, a, a signal to the controller, and it says, hey, there is a chunk of metal on top of you. Uh, give it the right away, get it out of here, okay? So, so they, they, they do that switch, okay? And then there's also all kinds of technologies, like for example, video now. We're using a lot of video to determine, to move away from the sensors in the road, because it's a little bit difficult to put them in the road, so you have to stop traffic, and then you have to have your crew cutting the road, and then putting the sensors in, and you close the road for a little bit. People get a little annoyed. So, so we wanna be more efficient. So now what we're doing is we're installing cameras, like video cameras overhead, and so the camera can look at the length of the queue Okay, and when you look at the length of the queue, then you know how many vehicles you have there and you know how much time you have to assign to that platoon to move, okay? So that's how we activate the traffic signals. And there's a lot of um, new technologies that are being implemented now. Have you seen, actually the city of Winnipeg is just spending a huge amount of money on the um, um, re-signalization of the entire, of a lot of corridors actually. And have you seen those, uh, if you go to, um, St. Mary's and Bishop. There's those long antennas with a little dish at the top and then a little uh, pole sticking up like right from the dish. That's all wireless communication. And so what they do is those antennas, they communicate with each other and they, they send special signals to the master controllers in downtown Winnipeg to say, hey, there is cars here, we need to move. Okay, we need to move them. So, so that's how you, um, you have evolved in terms of traffic signals. But then there's also been other technologies, right? Lots of technologies that have affected transportation engineering, that have affected transportation in general. Starting with the compass, you know, like we need to know which way is north, right? I mean, that's important when you're creating maps, I guess. Um, and we, then we moved into things like uh, um, GPS. GPS, or Global Positioning Systems, allowed huge changes in the way in which we do things now in transportation. <coughs> And we have a set of satellites just surrounding the globe. And uh, these satellites, they can send signals to special devices, like you have cell phones, right? Text messaging, you do your GPS, you have your, G your maps. I mean, you guys, you look at those things, you take it for granted. You should have seen my, my first cell phone. It was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> big. <laughs> so <laughs> that one, I bet you, did not have GPS, okay? It did not have any of that stuff. It was, I was lucky to actually get a signal to phone somebody. Okay, so, uh, but now those little things, they come like very small and you can know exactly where you are whenever you want. We have LiDAR technology that can actually just take a snapshot of where you are and map the entire area. But I think a really fascinating thing now, very cool thing, is this um, Google Maps and the Street View concept. And um, so for example, um, let's get into the University of Manitoba and this is gonna have a huge impact on how we um, uh, do things in transportation engineering. Because, how many people have played with this? Ah, cool. So, uh, because you can actually see the road the way it was when the pictures were taken, right? And you can walk down the road and you can do all kinds of things with it. I mean, you can, uh, if you're doing any type of analysis, any type of studies, it's very easy for you to just go to the place without ever being there, okay? Right? And it really has revolutionized, not, not so much now, but it will very soon revolutionize the way in which we do things in transportation. You can go any place in the world, basically, and do this. 
And I, I have to admit though, when they took the picture of my house, I don't like that picture. I should just get another one taken. But I think it'll be a little bit difficult to get that. But anyway, so um, uh, this is a new technology, a new concept that is actually changing the way in which, in which we're gonna be doing things in transportation. But the challenge, like we always, it's very cool, it's very cool to have technologies. And I always say to my students, good for you, okay? Let's like have the technology, let's use it, let's think about applying it. But I think the challenge is, is that engineers must make critical decisions about the systems that will affect thousands of people, okay? And think about this. When you as an engineer design something, if I design a road and it's built, if I plan design the interstate highway system and I build it, I can't go back and say, oh, you know what? I, didn't, I don't like the way I did that. You know, I cut right through that neighborhood and I segregated people there. I'm like, no, I'm just gonna do it again. You can't. Once it's done, it's done for 100 years, for 1,000 years, okay? Like, you, it's, it stays there. So we have to make those very critical decisions and it's very important to think about the implications of those decisions. So what we gotta remember is that the role, our role as engineers, is to make the best possible choices to use transport effectively together with other public and private actions to meet the goals of our society. Because like I said, values change and things change. And as society moves, we are there to meet the demand and to meet the values that they have. So we gotta make those decisions always taking into consideration of the society at the time and the needs of the society at the time. Now let's say, uh, and, and we do that by using technology as a tool, okay? Intelligent transportation systems is something that took, uh, it started in the late 1980s, 19, uh, early 1990s, really started taking off and now has really taken off. And uh, <clears throat> I wanna show you this little uh, uh, video just about a general concept of ITS. This is just a series of uh, images that are going to give you an idea about what ITS is.
Okay, so uh, can somebody tell me what ITS is then? Who can tell me after watching that little clip what is ITS? Now give me a little bit more, okay? Don't give me examples of what ITS applications, okay? <laughs> Actually, they didn't, did they show OnStar? They didn't. <laughs> this was a premeditated answer. <laughs> what is ITS? Yes? Intelligent uh, transportation systems. Yes, intelligent transportation systems. And what does that involve? <laughs> yes? Um, sensors and mechanics determine what needs to be moved where and when. Yes? So, like, if a train's coming, tracks switch on that and direct where it's supposed to go. Okay. Anything else? Um, computers? <laughs> anything about computers? computers? Um, international we manage. And satellites to <laughs> That's good. See, she has it exactly right. <laughs> so, 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 ITS. If you had to condense what ITS is, it's really, it's, it's very simple, really. Like when you have those definitions, they're very simple. The difficulty is to actually apply this stuff. It's the application of advanced technologies in transportation to save lives, time, money, energy, and the environment. Okay. And there's a lot of applications. In the trucking industry, we use it, say, for fleet management to know where the trucks are, uh, at what time, so that we can either ship more stuff or stop, from, uh, stop stuff from being sent uh, to expedite uh, deliveries. If we, have a if we have a factory and we need stuff to be delivered right in time, we use GPS, we use ITS technologies to know when exactly the, the shipment should arrive and at what, uh, um, under what circumstances. We use uh, uh, navigation systems, that's GPS uh, use, and that's also ITS application. Um, so navigation systems tell you where to go, where to turn, uh, when you get uh, lost. And sometimes you get lost because of them, but uh, that's another story. Uh, we use ITS for uh, tolling systems to tell people, uh, communicate with people. Uh, messages. We are using advanced technologies now, and we actually have a couple of installations here in Winnipeg. Uh, we're using the advanced technologies to detect pedestrians at intersections. And you know, when you when you go to a traffic signal, you push the button, and then you get the the, um, the signal, the walking face. Well, now what we're doing is we're installing those technologies just to see, to try to detect the pedestrian, so that the pedestrian, if you're in a wheelchair or if you cannot. You're not in a, in a position, in a physical position to push the button. What we're doing is the detectors just basically detect the pedestrian and talk to the signal and say, hey, there's somebody there that needs to cross. Do your thing and let them cross, okay? So that we make the system a little bit more equitable, so it's more fair for everyone, so that nobody has to push anything to get across. So we're, we're using that, we're in the testing phase right now. Um, what about the next 25 years, okay? So this is uh, to 2035. Um, what do you think is going to be happening in the next 25 years? There's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of things that will happen in the next 25 years. Technology will evolve enough to um, provide us with many opportunities. For example, opportunities to save lives. And a lot of uh, this is in the area of um, vehicle dynamics, vehicle performance. OnStar being an example. OnStar is implemented right now. But there's going to be a lot of things coming, uh, coming um, uh, our way in the future. Mercedes-Benz, for example, or Mercedes, put out this, uh, and here's, the, um, here's the, the concept. What they have is they have this new system that has recently been implemented. It's called pre-safe. And, and talk about a smart system. So when a vehicle goes out of control, so if the, if the sensors determine that you are going to have a collision, the vehicle prepares itself for the collision. So it readjusts the seat, it adjusts the headrest, um, it um, rolls up the windows, which I have issues with that. Okay, it rolls up the windows. Uh, it, uh, so it does all kinds of things to protect you from uh, injury uh, in the case of this collision. Now, there is a fundamental issue here though. I mean, this is a very phenomenal system. It's very important. But as engineers, we always have to think about everyone. Okay, we can not only think about certain classes of people, right? So the question is, of course, right now, this system can only be afforded by people who have the enough resources, enough money to buy this type of car, right? So that basically puts, 
you know, other people in a situation where, well, does that mean that if I'm poor, I am not going to be safe? Okay? So, so as engineers, we have to continue to develop the technology. And over the next 25 years, we are definitely going to be seeing these types of systems come into the market for all, the, for all users. So we can all, can, oh, we can all afford these systems. There is a, um, different types of sensors that identify danger in the, under different situations. This little video shows a combination of uh, systems that tell you different things. Um, and these are things that are coming down the pipe. So let's just look at this a couple minutes uh, video. So just look at it. Prepare okay, to stop. A, he's a bad actor, okay? But that's another story. <laughs> like, what? Ah. Oncoming traffic. Cross traffic. So, so these are some of the technologies. The automobile industry has uh, been working for a number of years, and you will see a lot of that uh, in the next 25 years. We'll also see, I think, a lot of technologies dealing with uh, communication between the roadside and the vehicles. Also, in terms of uh, the trucking industry, a lot of technologies basically communicating with the dr truck drivers to uh, detect vehicles that are either behind them in the blind, uh, spa, in the blind uh, zones or in front of them in case they, they're too close to the, to the truck. Um, but one thing that's interesting though, and, and I always say this to my students, is that we always, as engineers, we always have to be aware of what we do and what's going on around us. And, and you can see, even with this type of technology, there could be a lot of liability issues when you rely on the technology to make the decisions for you. So we always have to balance those things. It's not an easy thing to do, but we always have to take all those things into consideration. Okay? There's also opportunities in uh, reduction of congestion. So uh, there's been a lot of tests now done in terms of trying to get groups of vehicles basically drive themselves. Uh, sensors in the road, and the idea there is to reduce the gap between vehicles so that now we can use more space rather than um, uh, so reduce the space between the, the cars so that we don't have to build more infrastructure. Of course, we will need to build more infrastructure, but what we have to do is use it more intelligently. So take advantage of technologies more and more. Um, this, uh, this system that we are using now already, but will be more intensely deployed in the future. So telling people when there are collisions, acting immediately, doing real-time applications so that the in-pavement sensors actually communi uh, communicate with uh, some central system and speaks about the entire situation at the site and you can send emergency services so that you don't uh, plug up the system when that's happening. Accommodation of all users is important. Here's a new concept, very interesting concept. It's called Velo City, and uh, this is a new concept in Toronto actually. And the issue here is that we're going to be developing system, a system of uh, 
aerial uh, tunnels, if you will, where you're going to be able to drive uh, or to ride bi bi bicycles. And uh, the network is very large. The idea is to uh, have people who are more uh, sustainable, transportation oriented, use these, uh, these uh, uh, facilities so that they can get to their destinations just as fast as, uh, with, um, as if they were driving a vehicle or a car. And if you look at the map, the orange lines are the, uh, show the extent of the network for these tunnels. So Toronto is moving forward in this, uh, in this uh, type of uh, area, de developing, deploying technologies so that we can have uh, massive, uh, sustainable bicycle transportation. Um, so you can expect to see at least some of this in the future. Reducing energy consumption. Um, Bosch has just developed a concept or a, the first vehicle with a start-stop engine, which basically reduces idling. So if a, if a car stops, um, then the engine shuts off after a certain period of time. By about 2015, it is expected that half of the European countries will have this system in place. Now, the US hasn't quite bought, uh, bought into the idea, but you can expect that with time, as there's more and more pressure to uh, reduce um, emissions, we're going to be seeing some of this type of technology. And of course, there's other technologies that assist uh, pedestrians, technologies that assist in the movement of freight, particularly with those uh, uh, movement of containers at the ports, huge issues in trying to identify where the container is, when it left China, how it's making its way to your uh, to, the, to a certain warehouse. So there's a lot of issues that have to do with that. So the last thing I want to show you is, a, is a, a short video, about six minutes, that basically summarizes what the future of transportation is, uh, is for, say, the 21st century, what we're uh, uh, expecting to see. This was put together by, uh, by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And it's really interesting because it shows the entire picture. America, where is it going? And you can replace the word America with Canada, Europe, get there? anything you want, okay? <laughs> what challenges will we everywhere. face? How will we meet them? Over the past year, transportation leaders have worked with stakeholders and customers to develop a new vision for the 21st century. The goals? Reduce congestion, keep America globally competitive, and meet mobility needs. We have to develop what I'd call a new conceptual framework. We have to, in fact, rethink the transportation issue from a much more fundamental basis. Instead of asking ourselves, where is the congestion problem, where is there a safety problem, and, and those are real, we should ask ourselves, what kind of world do we want to live in? What is the transportation system that we would create? as a framework for the world we want to live in. 2056, the future is unknown. But many changes are already evident. Another 140 million people, almost double the number of vehicles. The emergence of mega regions housing most of the population growth and most economic expansion. An explosion of freight movement through ports, highways and rail new energy sources, and global climate concerns. The biggest challenge that we face is that I don't think we fully appreciate the extent to which the world is changing and how different the needs are going to be in 20 or 30, 40 years. For that matter, perhaps we don't even appreciate the extent to which the needs will be different in 10 years. How will goods be manufactured and delivered? What corridors will they travel? How will transportation meet the challenge? Preparing for the future, our priority must be to preserve and modernize the system we have. Pavement foundations will have to be rebuilt, and many bridges will have to be rebuilt or replaced. Our system has to be safer, more reliable, and free of congestion. Advanced technology and improved operations can help squeeze every ounce of performance out of the system we have, 
but new capacity will be essential. Travel on the U.S. highway system has increased five-fold over the past 50 years and could more than double in the next 50. Even with policies to cut the rate of growth by 50 percent, travel will have increased over 800 percent between 1955 and 2055. Unless we respond, today's congestion will only become far worse by doubling and redoubling transit ridership, expanding intercity rail, and encouraging walking, telecommuting, and other policies. We can reduce travel growth by half. But the need to add new capacity is a certainty. Research shows the need to add 80,000 lane miles to the 210,000 mile interstate highway system, 14,000 lane miles for trade corridors, and 8,000 center line miles for truck only corridors. Expansion of the national highway system and the network of arterials and collectors is needed as well. More transit, rail, and ports capacity is also required. We also need to keep America competitive in the global economy. We face sweeping change in world trade routes as new trade blocks mature in the global network. Other nations are investing aggressively in transportation infrastructure to build up their economies. This nation is facing really some major decisions as to whether or not we want to compete the global level or we're going to allow uh, neighboring countries to be um, bigger competitors. The question for us is, are we willing, are we able, are we committed to compete at that level? Americans expect and deserve a transportation system that is safe, that is dependable, that gets them where they want to go when they need to get there. Good jobs, security, livable communities, protecting and enhancing our environment, innovations in fuel and reduction of greenhouse gases. Transportation plays a role in all of these, both now and in the future. Achieving a new vision for America's transportation system will require a quantum increase in investment by all levels of government. It will take public-private ventures and it will take innovation in how we finance needed improvements. We need a much larger investment in all of the modes of transportation. We're very good at focusing on the cost of everything. We're not very good at focusing on the benefits we derive. Investments in transportation always return more than they cost. 2009 will be uh, upon us before you know it. There's a great deal of discussion that's going to occur in the uh, political arena. Uh, in 2008, uh, transportation and infrastructure and investment needs to be a part of that political discussion. And so uh, the time is ripe for user groups, uh, for organizations like the American Trucking Association, for those that build the roads, uh, for those that benefit the, uh, the, from the roads, need to be fully engaged and, and be prepared to go unified to Congress uh, in support of a national transportation vision. It's very important that all of us understand clearly what is important for transportation in the future. It's also critical for us that we move together collectively in concert and have a, a consistent message that the American public and Congress can understand. Within the United States, we must make that connection again in the public's mind between our economy and our transportation system. We have forgotten that and we are going to pay a horrendous price for this lack of investment. We must, as a nation, come together and make a bold move to invest in this critical infrastructure that supports the American economy. So this is a, a, it's a, I thought it was a nice clip that basically summarizes everything uh, that you have to look at towards uh, to in the next few years. But I think I want to leave you with this. Technology will make things possible. Because technology has worked over the years, and it has evolved, and it has changed. And over the next 25 years, 30, 40 years, it will make things possible. But do not forget, I mean, you're very young, and you're starting your lives now. Don't forget 
that technology is only a tool, okay? It's only a tool. You will need, you will still need your brain. You will need innovation and you will need creativity to make things happen. So I want to leave you with those ideas. I want to thank uh, uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, uh, U of M student chapter for helping uh, me with this presentation. And uh, there's their website if you want to learn more about ITE. And I also want to thank uh, all the people at the, in the transportation division for uh, contributing uh, a lot of the ideas.